Okay, so my name is Saul Sebastian. I'm the founder of a program called The Alchemy of Man, which is uh, men's work, and it covers a wide range of things, but especially in relation to hormonal health, sexual health, relational health, uh, and just being a man, being a dude in this world, uh, trying to live at his best. And my work takes me to a very many parts of the world and I travel and have traveled quite extensively for the past well, since the mid 90s and but especially in the past decade or so I've been traveling quite a lot and since meeting my partner my partner in crime and wife Saida Desale who does work with women uh, we've been sort of on the road for many years and really consider the world our home it's, it's hard to sort of pinpoint one particular place that is home for us. So, so the idea of conscious nomads is something that's quite close to my heart as well as my wife's heart because we are quite nomadic in the true sense of the word. And yeah, it's okay. something I have a lot to share about. Uh, can you give us an idea of what your travel's been like over the last several months or, or longer? Where have you been? What have you been, what have you been doing? The last several months we've been in Bali, which is where we're back to here, uh, but in the past few months we've been in South Africa, in the middle of the uh, some of the most game rich, some of the most predator rich game reserves in Africa, um, hanging out with lions and hyenas and elephants, like very very close from here to this, same distance from here to the camera in fact, and we've been really loving that, that was an amazing experience. We've also been in Amsterdam where we spent two months putting together some online content. Part of our work is has an online component so we spent quite some time in Amsterdam where the internet was good, <laughs> where we managed to put together quite an extensive program. Uh, we've been mostly throughout, it, we've been a little bit more settled this year in terms of uh, what we're used to. We usually travel very rapidly. So, uh, My partner has been in, in many more places this year. She's been in Australia and, and Canada and Europe. And, I mean, we've, it's a li little hard to track actually where we've been this year. But I think the highlights for us were South Africa, um, yeah. for sure. That was the one place that really, really stood out for us this year. Okay. Uh, did you become mobile as a necessity for this business or this type of business? Or did no, you plan your business around being mobile? The business was planned around being mobile because we're both we're both gypsies at heart, and we have always loved to travel. And it's something that's I think I really love about being with, with my partner because we both have this passion to be mobile and to, to see as much and to, to, to really eat in as much of this world as we can. And, and we have no children. We have we're sort of pretty footloose and fancy free in that aspect. So. We really made the most of that, and and we have an appetite. Let's say we have a very big appetite to see as much of this planet as humanly possible. Yeah. And what are some of the things you find attractive about this kind of lifestyle? I think to get a little bit, you know, deep on you here, like the, the most attractive thing to it is that you don't get to, you can't fall asleep when you're moving around. You can't settle into one place for too long that you start to take things for granted and you start to get a little bit uh, localized in your thinking. You're consistently having to step back from the way you perceive the world and, and sort of appreciate your surroundings directly and, and not take things to, for granted. You, you need to continually be able to ask yourself where am I and who am I? <laughs> and that's a very deep existential question. Where am I and who am I? You know, and how is the world seeing it? And how am I seeing the world? And, and every new place you go to, you 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 are really confronted point blank with that question. And and you do put your foot in your mouth often. You know, when you go to new places, and you, you do you do tend to uh, bring your old mode of perceiving the world into a new place which is completely different and you sort of get whacked, you get a, you get a few slaps around the face on a sometimes a, a heavy level, sometimes on a very subtle level but but it makes you stop and realize 
that the world is not how it seems to be. The world is not how it's portrayed on CNN. The world is not how it's portrayed on Facebook and any any media, any any sort of electronic media that we're so plugged into these days. The world you need to experience the world on a on a limbic level. That is your you need to resonate. You need to feel a, a visceral, physical resonance with what's going on around you to really understand the truth of this world. You know, we see so much stuff on, on the TV and, and, and in internet and, and what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening in Europe and what's happening in America and the financial situation. And, and it just so much of it is bullshit compared to what's actually happening on the ground. And I think people need to relate to what's happening on an immediate community level as opposed to the the geopolitical level, which is which is very manipulated, let's face it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what are some of the most important skills or abilities that you have that enable you to maintain this kind of lifestyle? <laughs> First is mind. The ability to stop, ask questions, ask yourself, is this really what's going on? You know, to really check in with, with your emotional state when you're in different situations and understand, you know, are you jet lagged? Are you triggered? Are you, are you suffering from an environmental issue, like excess heat or humidity or what's going on around you that's causing all this stuff to come up within you when you go to new places? And just learn to be able to stop and assess the situation, stop and receive, be in a very receptive, open-hearted frame of mind. I think, I think that's the number one thing. It's, it's what happens in our mind and our heart, you know, the attitude we bring to each place we go to. Physically, I would say that the, for me and, and my partner, I mean, we're both very physical. Uh, we've done a lot of physical training and we're, it's something that we're good at and it's something we, we use to maintain ourselves in different countries. Um, just staying strong, staying physically strong, staying, staying strong in terms of your core, your digestion, your digestive, digestive strength, your physical and postural alignment, your, I mean, there these are like, these have saved our asses in many situations where we've been in really bad travel situations where flights are shut down or like we've arrived, have, you know, traveled for hours and hours and hours and spent days traveling to, from one place to another and if we hadn't have maintained or done some exercises beforehand, we'd be, we'd probably come down with some bad illness or some, something that would knock us out for a few days. So, so physical health is, is super important for us and, and maintaining that before and after we arrive somewhere. Uh, also, just really creating space on the, you know, after you arrive somewhere, especially if you have a jet lag issue, to really create a few space of a few days to help acclimatize to the environment before teaching or before, and we, we, te we teach overseas, so we make sure we don't run any events or having to do any sort of major work -ish thing or online sort of issue. Um, while we're sort of like half zombie mode, you know, coming from one end of the world to the other. Jet lag is always an issue to deal with. It's something that, that, that's, that takes quite a bit of conscious work in dealing with. And one of the ways we deal with that is um, we don't eat when we're flying, generally. We don't eat, we just drink fluids. So our body's in so, a sort of a suspended sort of state and when we come to the new place, we start getting on a new cycle by eating at the regular cycles we normally would. That's one really good little hint. Uh, acidophilus is always like really high grade acidophilus, um, like every day is really cool. There's a lot of little medical sort of little tips and tr little things you get acclimatized to and that you use to, to keep you sort of healthy and. Um, that, so you're not having to go to doctors. I mean, we, we pretty much avoid doctors at all costs. That's our motto, is, right. is be your own barefoot doctor. You know, I think there was a really cool book a while ago back called The Barefoot Doctor or something like that. There's a book like this, yeah. Anyway, there's a book I remember which was all about how to take care of yourself while traveling. And 
I didn't really get to read the book, but I, I can understand the necessity to really be your own doctor. That, that's a huge one for me. Um, it's a mind, your mind, your, your emotions, your health. And then there's all the other logistical sort of things, like customs. And, you know, it's a whole minefield in itself. So. You're sure? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like what you're doing is currently the highest expression of this offering, or do you envision it going to other places and, and doing other things? Um, what we're actually doing? Yeah, I mean the actual work? form of what you're teaching and what okay, you're offering. Yeah. There's always higher. There's always a, a, a new idea. There's always a new inspiration that, 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 that expands you. I think. I think if I was to be in one place doing what I do, um, I would still be giving my highest offering. You know, I would still be. If I was the sort of person that would would be just really homebound and like to stay in one place for very long periods of time, and, and I was doing what I was doing in a more local environment, yeah, I'd, I'd still be offering my highest offerings. I think traveling for me uh, is as much a selfish act you know, as it is a giving. I mean, I, I, I give a lot when I travel, I give a lot to the communities I, I visit, I give a lot to the people I meet, the locals especially, like the locals here in Bali, I'm just really, you know, I, I really come in with a deep humility with the people here and really respect their work and their, 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 what, they, what, they, what they give you here. And that's just, they're beautiful people. So I'm really conscious of that. But my highest offering is, is, is done wherever I go and whatever I do. But I think for traveling, I'm the student. You know. When I travel, I'm the student. I'm always reminded of, of being in beginner's mind and being able to stay in that state of continual, wow, the mystery, the, 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 the innocence, the great mystery of life is, is around every corner. You know, and that, that's what feeds me and it feeds my wife. And, we, and that in turn inspires us to offer more. In a sense, we don't get to, we don't fall asleep and get lazy with our offerings. You know, we, we're continually updating what we offer and what we teach and, and what we provide based on our own learning. You know. It's good advice, good yeah. perspective. Yeah. Uh, do you do you feel that living a location-free lifestyle as you do and as you have been contributes anything significant? To the world at large, you know the big, the bigger picture. We, we touched yeah, on this look, I, I think it does, and this is a really interesting question. And I think nowhere in history has there been this much prolific travel of human beings around the world. Like it really is interesting to see how the world is right now. It's like one of those. One of those little things you used to buy with the, with the snow in it, like you shake it up and things are just everywhere. I mean, it's just like if you get one of those things with little people in it and a little globe and you shook it up, I mean, that's really how it is right now. There's, the world is shaking up. The world is being shaken up in such a massive way, in good ways and bad ways. But definitely, human beings are, if you trace the, 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 the migration paths of it, the earliest human beings from out Africa you trace these, these different pathways around the world and see where they all settled and landed and started to develop their communities and their way of living. And now it's coming back. You know, now we've got, you know, China taking over Africa or we've got, you know, all these different countries going back to Africa, the roots, and then starting to change the whole matrix of Africa. And just as an example of, of how things have come full circle in a very strange way. You know, the old, old Greek colonies, you know, being taken over by international, um, you know, the, if you look at that, that's an amazing thing when you think that the, that the, the Greeks fended off the, uh, the eastern horde, the, the hordes from the east for, for so many years, for, for decades, for centuries, and then, and now it's just been completely taken over by eastern interests, completely through a different vehicle. It, it's pretty wild when you think about migra migratory paths, and, and but I think as a traveller, and what I have, what I think. So I think 
when you travel, I think your consciousness does generally change, and and and, and while it may sound pretentious somehow, it, it's very true to say that you do change. Your, your consciousness does change. You, you it, it definitely happens. You you start seeing the world as a true cosmopolitan, or as a true man, of, citizen of the world, which I think the word actually means, right? Cosmopolitan. Is that right? Citizen of the world, right? That's what the word means. And what that looks like is that you don't identify with, like, I, I'm an Australian-born citizen, so, but I just don't identify with Australia anymore. I don't see myself as this patriot Australian uh, or... You know, and I really, you know, while I love Australia in its own right, I don't identify with myself as an Australian. I identify, my, I, I truly identify myself as an Earth being. I really, I don't know, again, it sounds like some New Age sort of, you know, crock. But, but look, I think that's where the world's going, let's face it. We, we, when we stop identifying ourselves as this nationality or this nationality or this nationality, we start to go, okay, so if we are citizens of the Earth, how the hell are we going to coexist? How the hell are we going to do that whilst maintaining biodiversity, cultural diversity, um, spiritual diversity? You know, how are we going to do that without creating a monoculture? You know, how are we going to keep the richness of this planet without making it all like a Walmart? You know, it's a very, it's it's, it's an interesting thing. So, I think there's two sides to. It. I think I think. Becoming a world citizen and traveling and then bringing yourself all around the planet and spreading yourself out has has a bright side and it helps to make connections between things that would normally be considered very opposing. But it can also bring so it can bring that together. But all, it can also bring a lot of it can also inject a sense of uh, an, a very insidious spread of monoculture around the world that that can actually. cause havoc to, to, the, to, the, to the richness of each culture. You know, and I think even in really well-meaning travelers, even in people who are so-called eco-tourists who go around, uh, you know, going to different cultures, I mean, it's, it's hard to say what effect we're having on the world. When, when we come to a place like Ubud in Bali, for example, and bring yoga culture to Bali or bring, you know, um, raw food to Bali, for example, like, like, what actually goes on in the culture? I mean, I mean, sure, it's, there's healthy alternatives, but, but, but how does that affect the actual richness of this culture, the deep, deep richness of this culture? You know, just this is an, as an example. So I wonder about that. I wonder about what effect we are having, and uh, I'm not convinced, well, I think there's really healthy aspects of it, I'm not convinced that we're not having also a detrimental effect on the, 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 the cultural diversity of this, of this country, of this planet. I think when, it, when someone like me or anyone really travels a lot and brings different attitudes to different countries, they need to be really mindful that they're not just stepping into a, a, a new environment, they're stepping into a whole matrix of perception that... that That you know can can be that can change for the better or the worst, depending on what they bring to it. So that's why I'm always when I come to a place like Bali, I'm always very humbled by the people, and, and I always really defer defer to them as the, the people that lead the situation in a lot of cases. You know, and and just as an example of that, you know, like let's say you would go to see a healer, and that healer can look at you and see everything about you that's out of whack. Way more than any Western doctor can see. They can see your essence. They see exactly what's going on inside you. They know exactly what's wrong with you. But you might be someone who's really like some, some brash American or Australian guy who's just coming saying, oh, you know, I've given you money. I want to be healed. You know, you've got this, this sort of transactory, trans transactory perception of the, you know, what's meant to go down. So I've given you money, now you've got to heal me. You have this 
you have this sort of expectation that, that, that now they've got to do something to you or something for you. And so there's a sort of a, 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 I often see when Westerners come to a place like Bali, for example, there's a greedy, there can often be a, an, a, a, a certain greed or a certain fixed agenda on what needs to happen and what should happen. When in actual fact, what the person should be doing is just shutting the hell up, relaxing, and just opening his heart to what the situation really requires and letting the people of that, that culture to lead that experience and just to open himself to whatever happens, not be, not be too fixed or have too much an agenda or a preconception of what should or shouldn't happen. I think, I think to me that's the most important thing any person should bring to any nomadic lifestyle. Is just, is just shut up, step back, relax into the situation and just let the environment lead the situation. So like make a choice for sure, make a choice to have a great experience but, but don't bring too much of an agenda to, to what's actually going on. I think that's, that, that would be my number one <laughs> bit of advice. You know. Well, my next question is, kind of similar to that, writing on the coattails of that, what specific advice would you give to someone wanting to follow a similar path that you're following? Not just the travel, but specifically, you know, somebody who has something they feel they want to teach, they want to go out into the world and, and bring it to people in, in uh, various countries. My advice for them is learn to be a student first. Get what you get down. You know, know what you teach and know it well. Know your, know, your, know your offering to the world well, whatever that is. Whatever it's a teaching thing or it's a, it's a support role, whether it's a, whether you cook well, whether it's like you look after kids well, whether it's you're a, a community spokesperson, whatever you do, whatever skill set you bring to it, whether it's a, a really complex uh, computer skill or it's a simple healing modality, whatever it is, whatever you have to offer, I think... You need to go into any place as a student first. You need to go in and consider yourself more of a student than a, than a teacher. And just sort of get, learn to do that first. And then when you feel like it's appropriate, then bring your talents to bear. Show what you've got to, to offer. And you know, to come in all gun, guns blazing, say, I'm here to save the world. Sometimes the world just doesn't need saving. You know? And I think a lot of people forget that. People come in with these really fixed assumptions on, on how the world is and how much they need to save the world. When there's a lot of places that don't need saving, actually. As bleak as sometimes it appears, it's still a percept there's still a lot of your perception involved. And you need to sort of, you know, <laughs> pull off that perception for a moment and just look at what is and just open yourself to... to, to to being a student of the world, as opposed to someone who's just running around trying to save the world, I think that's you know that's something I, I you know I think good advice on, on some level. I think it's great advice. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure.